everybody. Welcome to this video today where I'm going to be doing something slightly different than my normal sort of gaming let's plays. I'm going to be doing a bit of a tutorial actually on basically how to set up a few things on um, how to set up your own ARC server. Um, obviously, as anyone who has followed my YouTube channel over the last few weeks, months, well now I've been playing a lot of ARC. And there are a number of reasons why you may want to set up your own server as opposed to just playing single player. And those reasons I will go into as we're going through the video. Now to set up a server sounds very complicated and it can be. <laughs> there is, however, a very useful tool that makes this process a lot, lot easier. So the first thing you need to do is basically go and download a program called Arc Server Manager. Now that's easy to find over on, on Google. You just do a Google search for Arc Server Manager. And then obviously click the download link. It brings you to this page and you just download the latest zip, which is always going to be the latest version of the, of the tool. Obviously they give you the release notes to show you what they've added with each version of the, uh, the tool as they update it because obviously they update it when art gets updated backwards and forwards between the two. So it's, it's always going to be up to date, downloaded. Now I've already gone ahead and downloaded it to save a bit of time. So basically you get the, the latest zip and basically you just want to unzip that to a location. Now I've gone and unzipped it to a folder on my desktop called Arc Server Manager. And if I open that up, basically you get this folder. And in it, obviously, you've got all the files to do with Arc Server Manager. Now, a warning for people who have sort of very hypersensitive um, antivirus and internet security, it may flag the Arc Server Manager exe file as being a virus, and it may flag this um, DLL file here as being a virus. They're not. The false positives so you may have to exclude those two files from your security i'm using norton which isn't the best but i have to exclude those two files from norton search because it keep kept removing them so once you've got obviously the program unzipped another thing to note is that arc server manager needs to be run as an administrator now, if you don't set that before you run it, it will prompt you each time when you double click it or come up with a prompt that says, do you want to run this program as an administrator? And you will have to click that each time you go into the program. So it's easier to set it in the compatibility tab. With that done, all you do is double click the program and it comes up with a window that says it appears you have not do not have a data directory set. The data directory is where your profiles and Steam command will be stored. It is not the same as the server installation directory, which you can choose for each profile. You'll be now asked to select the location where Arc Server Manager data directory is located. You may change this later in the settings window. So basically it's asking you now to confirm for the EXE where you've just unzipped all those files to and where it's going to need to download the, the Steam command tool. So basically I'm going to select that. So again, on my desktop, it's my folder, Arc Server Manager, done. It's going to store your profiles and Steam command in the following directories. Is this okay? For me, on this occasion, yes. And now it's going to download the Steam command. Which should take a few moments, normally pretty quick. And again, it connects to Steam anonymously, so you don't need to have Steam installed on the PC. You don't even have to have the game installed on the PC to download and install a server and set up a server and run a server. And OK, once that's done, you'll be presented with this window with not a lot in it <laughs> at this particular moment in time. So basically, you go into for what I learned, you've got obviously you've got op buttons along the top to reinstall the Steam command. Open the remote console. Open Arc Server Manager logs folders if you, if you, when your server is running. If you need to check your logs for any reason, there's a handy little button in the tool. You've got your open global settings. 
open help which links you to straight to the Arc Server Manager forum and obviously you've got your version number of Arc Server Manager and again a link to the patch notes you will get uh, another button that pops up from here to time to time whenever a new version is released to allow you to click on it to upgrade now what I generally do first of all upon running Arc Server Manager is I go into the global options and it gives you a bunch of um, thing so enable run as administrator prompt on startup so if you haven't gone into the um, file compatibility and set it to run as administrator this is where it obviously the setting is to prompt you manage firewall settings automatically so the pro arc server manager can automatically enter um, rules in your firewall software whatever firewall software you are using on your pc for ports and port forwarding stuff like that however it does not control your router so any port forwarding that needs to be done to your router your modem etc you will have to do yourself however the software is capable of handling most um software firewalls so again what your internet security program so again for me i'm running norton so it can add the necessary firewall settings to Norton for me, so you have to go in there and do it. Output Steam command to the progress window. Now, sometimes it's better to turn that off. And uh, change the language. I'm going to set it to English UK because I'm in the UK. Amount of XP need for new custom levels. You can set that. So that's what 100,000 uh, dino levels. 100,000 again if you're adding custom levels beyond the um, again settings there that you can play with validate profile on server start perform server and mod update on server start now that's an option you can have if you want your server to update and update the mods as well each time it starts uh, mod update settings update mods when updating the server force mod file downloads So again, it gives you handy little pop-ups there. Like there, it tells me if you enable this option, the mods will be downloaded from Steve, Steam even if the server has the latest version. Enabling can fix mod corruption issues. And force mod filing. Again, options there that can help you fix corrupt mods, and corrupt downloads. Uh, use anonymous credentials. You can, if you want, put in your Steam username, password and authenticate it. Uh, I generally set my user workshop cache expiry to 24 hours. So it updates the workshop more <laughs> frequently. Uh, enable auto backup, so backup interval. So it's going to create a backup every, every hour and delete backup files older than 30 days. Uh, you can enable auto update which again I think is to do with uh, shutdown 15 minutes so again some messages there about server shutdowns and stuff which can be automatically sent out to players so again those are just your global options okay so now you actually want to create your 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 server so you basically click on the little green plus icon here which is create new server profile and it comes up with unnamed profile. So the first thing you do is obviously you need to give your profile a name. So I'm going to call this Gaming for Fun The Island. Let's start on the island, shall we? And it's going to ask you installation folder, the Arc Server Game and Configuration folder. So again, set location. Now I'm going to set this on a different drive to what I normally want. So I'm going to set this on my T drive, which is an SS removable SSD. And then it says, um, obviously, installed version. At the moment, we do not have the server installed. So you click the install button. And what this will do, this will basically connect to Steam again does it anonymously so you don't have to have the game installed on the machine that you're setting the server up on and basically it'll download all the files it needs to run the server 
and it can take a few minutes depending obviously on how big that is and uh, as obviously this is the first time I'm installing this server it'll probably take quite a while because it's got to download the whole lot again once the when Arc is updated and new versions of Arc come out it'll only download small files whenever you click the this button will change from install to upgrade and verify once it's installed so once that's the case you could upgrade obviously the server whenever there is an update released for the game okay so the installation process has finished it says so it's, it's downloaded the server information whoops spelling mistake there so again we've got the install now so the server is ready to run once you've set up a few more obviously settings uh, your server password uh, your admin password spectator password you enter those here if you're going to have those features on your server uh, networking server ports now these are important these are the ports that the arc server manager your server sorry is going to use to enable communication with uh, the outside world you need to make sure that the port numbers listed here are correctly forwarded and open in your router otherwise no one's going to be able to access your server from outside your pc and you probably won't even be able to get your server published to steam's servers and stuff like that so you need to make sure these numbers are correctly set up and forwarded in your router now i'm not going to go into port forwarding and tell you how to do that because everybody uses different brands of routers and every single router has a different interface for changing port forwarding and stuff like that. You need to look up your specific router models manual and work out how to do that. Now, one of the things as well you have to bear in mind, if you're running multiple servers on the same PC, you need to make sure that on the profiles, so this is obviously profile one for the island. If I have a second profile for the center and a third profile for scorched earth each profile must have different server port numbers they can't share the same port so the center a center profile that number here might change to 7779 and that might change to 27017 and so on and so on you'd have to keep incrementing it when you set up a new server and obviously make sure that those port numbers then are also correctly port forwarded. Login options. So use banlist URL. Now I, I select this straight away. This is a studio wildcard maintained global list of basically user IDs that have been banned from ARC, from the official servers and stuff like that. For obvious reasons, I enable that because if those people have done such things that they warrant getting a global ban from the official servers, you probably don't want them being able to access your game and causing whatever mayhem <laughs> they've done in the past to your servers. And this is constantly kept up to date by Studio Wildcard. So you've got max players. This is the maximum number of players that your server that can join your server. Defaults, it defaults to 70. You can obviously change that with the slider. Obviously, the more players you have, the more of a performance impact it's going to have on your server. And so on. I generally set it to about 40 for me. Uh, enable idle timeout. This is basically how long uh, a player can be unresponsive in-game before they are booted out of the server. It's normally default when it starts up it's set to 3600 but that's ages i changed it to 600 seconds which is obviously 10 minutes if a player's been sat doing nothing for 10 minutes boot them out especially if you're running you know a small server with limited slots because basically it enables someone else the chance to join then <laughs> uh, i don't touch any of the uh, recon port setting stuff and obviously, this is the section here, maps and mods, where you basically get to set up which map you're running on. So, obviously, this profile's for the island, so it's running the island map. If I wanted to change it to the center, you could do so. Or 
scorched earth and it changes it to scorched earth. You've then obviously got your total conversion ID. So again, if you want to run a total conversion mod or the official primitive plus, these are the way you do it. And then you've got your mod IDs. This is where you would put in your IDs for mods that you wish to obviously have installed and running on your server. Now to find official mods, click on the question mark icon. It opens up a window. Click on the little green plus icon. And basically it'll do a quick scan of the Steam Workshop and bring you up a list of all the mods on your that are available on to download and install. So for example, you want to add a mod. Now, one of the mods I always use, obviously it's Structures Plus. So again, you would find it, hit the green plus. That then adds it. You would then click save. It gives you a message obviously, because it's not downloaded at this moment in time. Click yes. You can close that. And as you see, it's now entered that mod ID. Obviously it will, comma separate all the different mod IDs as you add them. Once you've got your mods added to actually download and install them on your machine, you would hit the, the green arrow here that would download and install the mod, the mods, if you're using multiple mods. And basically if you want to update the mods, then once they are installed, you would just click that and it basically it will check for the new versions and install them. Uh, you can enable the extinction event if you want. I've never done that. Here you've got your auto save period. This is the time in which obviously the server will save and create a backup um, and save the, uh, the world. It's currently set to 15 minutes. I generally don't tend to reduce it because it can cause lag. And obviously, depending how many players you have on your server, you may actually find you need to increase that. Uh, then you've got, obviously, server options. So you can do things like disable the Valve anti-cheat system, disable anti-speed hack detection, disable player move physics optimization. I don't know why you'd want to do any of that. That would then open up your, your server to be hacked and exploited. Enable the battle eye anti-cheat system. That's normally turned off, but obviously turn it on because you want to make sure your server is secure and isn't going to be um, open to abuse from people. Um, again, because I'm running a pretty decent PC with an i7 processor, I tick the box to use all available cores, um, use cache. So again, what you'll find is by you ticking this box, when you start your server up the first time, it takes quite a long time to start. The next time you start the server up, the start time gets a little bit shorter and then so on, it gets shorter and shorter until eventually it reaches like a performance point where it doesn't take too long to start up. Um, the options on this side of the screen, these are for people running probably lower spec PCs, lower spec systems. You can obviously force the game to use DirectX 10 instead of 11, uh, Shader Model 4 instead of 5, you can force it to use lower memory, you can force it to disable a lot of the advanced sky features, um, things like that. So again, it enables basically this, the, the server to use less resources, and then for actual people playing the game, it's going to be less resource intensive as well. So again, if you are going to have friends play, if some of your friends have got lower spec PCs, this gives them the option to obviously be able to get in game and play. I don't enable any of those. Um, the other option, which is important to me, or is going to be important to me going forward, is this cross arc data transfer cluster ID. This basically is a, an ID that you create, specify, which you then need to put into each of the servers you're running if you want to enable transfers between those servers if you want your players to be able to transfer to the different maps. So at the moment, obviously, I've, I'm setting up the island, but once I've set up the center and scorched earth, I would like to be able to move between those in-game. This is where you do it. You need to set the cluster ID exactly the same on each map. Then you've got, obviously, your server log options here, server admin logs, 
Admin logs include tribe logs. And again, I like to keep an eye on tribes. And again, maximum number of tribe logs, 500. Again, you can specify what you want in there. Um, this is your command line. So if you want to add additional command line arguments, you can do. This currently shows you the current command line used to basically start your server. Very useful for checking. Then you've got obviously your automatic management settings. So again, shut down the server. I have it set to shut down at 3 a.m. in the morning, my time, and then restart. Um, a server is included in the auto backup cycle, which is what I specified earlier on in the global settings and enable periodic auto updates. So again, the server is, check is checking and whenever there's an update to the game or any updates to the mods, it can shut the server down, install those updates and then restart the server. Which makes things a lot easier to administrate if you're away from the mission. So the next section, obviously rules. This is where you can enable things like your PVE, your PVP, uh, prevent building in resource rich areas. There was another option I wanted to cover somewhere. And I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's a bit further down. It probably is a lot further down, actually. <laughs> um, max players in tribes. So again, you could determine how the maximum number of players in a tribe. Uh, enable your difficulty override. Max dino level. Now, normally what will happen here is it's normally... When you first create a profile, it's set at 120, which is the default maximum difficulty on the island map. Um, now, I can never remember which way around it is, but for the center or the scorched earth, the maximum difficulty is 150. And beyond that, obviously, you can set the difficulty to whatever you like. And that determines the basically the difficulty of the dinosaurs in the wild. So obviously, if you move the slider all the way up to the top, the maximum level they can spawn at is 1,200, which would absolutely annihilate you. But again, so you've got that that functionality. So again, I, I set it to 200. It rounds it down to 199 for whatever reason. I don't know why. Now, this next section, the enable tribute downloads, this is for people who are running, obviously, multiple servers and want to have the ability to transfer between the different maps. So enable tribute downloads. Tick the box here. No transfer from filtering. Basically, that disables people from being able to download items that they haven't acquired from your servers. So they can't bring stuff in that they've acquired on other unofficial servers to your servers. Only stuff that they, you know, makes it a bit more secure. You can then override timers on how long items that are stored are expiring before that you know people upload stuff to the in the obelisks and beacons you then can determine how long those items remain stored before before they're deleted again you don't want people storing too much stuff because that will affect performance on your servers at the same time you don't want to set it too short because you'll be deleting people's stuff and they'll probably get quite angry if you're running a PvP server, tick this box if you want to change the um, respawn periods when players are killed, died. Again, depending obviously on the type of server you're running. If you're playing amongst friends, you may want to change the respawn period so people can respawn a lot faster when they're getting killed because no one likes to sit staring at a, 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 a timing screen for several minutes. <laughs> and depending on if you've died a lot in quick succession, the uh, respawn period can get quite lengthy. Um, prevent offline PvP. I like to do that. And again, I set it, in my case, to 60 seconds. So 60 seconds after a player logs out, he, his structures and his dinos become inactive and invulnerable. So they can't, you can't be destroyed and raided offline which is a good good setting. Then you've got your PvE schedule. So again, if you are running a PvP server, but there are certain specific times where you want to disable the PvP and only have the PvE option, 
this is where you can do it. Again, this is sometimes a useful thing to have that people sometimes use instead of the offline PvP if they're playing on servers with different time zones and stuff. Um, and again, you can allow tribe alliances, allow tribe warfare, and allow cancelling of tribe warfare. So again, if you're on PvE, you've got the option to enable um, wars between tribes if both sides agree to it. Then you've got your allow custom recipes, and you can again, you, you've got the option here to change the effectiveness of the um, the recipes that you can create in cooking pots and industrial cookers. Your diseases, enable diseases, so swamp fever, and obviously set whether the diseases are permanent or not. I have it set to non-permanent, which means if a player dies, it dies, any diseases on him are reset they're removed again then you've got your chat and notification options so enable player left noble player joined they're pretty much just standards enable global voice chat enable proximity text chat if you want uh, hood and visual so allow cross set allow hood allow map player location that's normally you'll find turned off by default I turn it on because I like players to see where they are on the map. Allow third person view. Uh, allow hit markers. Um, so then it comes into player settings. So you've got your XP multiplier. So I'm going to go two and a half times. So XP. Maximum XP cap. I'm going to go for 10 million. Why 10 million? Because I like to add a couple of extra um levels that you can get which basically enables you to acquire more engrams uh damage set to one resistance one these are all your normal options and this is why i suggest even for the the person playing by themselves who would normally play single player in game it's better to maybe create a server and play on that because you get far more options to configure in the server than you do in the the menu in game. Now the PC menu is quite a bit limited. I don't know whether I can quickly show that. Can I? So yeah, if you're in game and you go to uh, host local, obviously this is the screen you get presented with. These are your options of mods, adding mods, choosing which map you're playing on, single player, host non dedicated multiplayer session, create new procedure to generate art. A bit on the light side when it comes to being able to configure settings. So basically, that's why I like going into and setting up the server because you can basically set a lot more options. Then you can change base stat multipliers and per level stat multiplier. So you can change this, use this section here to configure the starting levels of your attributes in game and how much of a, an attribute you gain each time you level up. So for example, if you wanted your crafting speed to go up from, you know, 100 points at a time, you could change the per level lap per per level stat multiplier if I can speak and you would change the normal rate I think normally it goes up by 10 points so again you would set that to 10 and you'd basically get 100 points <laughs> in that stat when you click on it when you level up you've got your dino settings so again max xp again again I've set it to 10 million because I had a couple of extra custom level ups damage do damage and tame damage now damage is done is the Value done by the wild dinosaurs. And tame damage is the damage that your dinosaurs do once they're tamed. So again, you can generally specify, I generally like to specify that the wild dinosaurs do a bit more damage. Because again, tame dinosaurs are probably going to get more damage anyway in game in the long run. Because you can level them up, they gain experience and they gain levels. Resistance as well, again, just give the base dino wild dinosaurs a bit of a buff. Uh, 
max number of tame dinos on the server is 4,000. This is not to be confused with the, the tribe limits that are being implemented on official servers by Studio Wildcard, which is obviously going to limit tribes to only having 400 dinos. Again, on a custom server, you can specify what rules you want. And again, then you've got the options here for dinosaur food drain, stamina drain, health recovery, dino spawns. This is how many spawn dinosaurs spawn on your map. So again, depending, you can increase that if you want to have more dinosaurs spawning throughout your world, or you can decrease it if you think dinosaurs spawn too much. And in fact, I'm probably going to do that, actually, because I think cer certain maps have way too many dinos on them. Your harvesting damage is obviously how much damage um, your dinosaurs do when they're harvesting. So again, the higher amount, the faster they're going to be able to gather resources. This option, I don't understand why it's in this section. This is turret damage. This is how much damage projectiles and bullets do from things like auto turrets, plant species X. Why that's in the dino settings, I don't know. But again, I like to have turrets doing lots of damage, so I specify it five times. Then you've got allow raid dino feeding. Now again, for anyone who plays Ark, knows about the Titanosaur, and knows that on official servers and in the single player game, if you can tame one of these creatures, you can only keep it for about 24 hours because there's no option to feed it. So it basically, once it's, once you tame it, it starves to death. So obviously you can basically allow that, which means if you do capture a Titanosaur on your server, you can keep it forever. And then you've got other options here, like enable, allow flyers in caves. If you want to allow flyers to be able to enter the caves, which is very helpful if you are playing by yourself and want to get the artifacts <laughs> you can prevent other things like dino mate boosts uh, disable non-meat fish loot so when you're fishing in game obviously you can acquire items and recipes and blueprints and stuff when you're fishing if you want you can disable that so that when you're fishing in game the only thing you're going to retrieve is fish meat and then there's an option here to force flyers when explosives are put on them Again, good option, because obviously one of the things people tend to do in PvP is basically put explosives on dinosaurs and then send them into people's bases as basically kamikaze-style attacks. That basically basically stops that <laughs> from happening. Uh, you've also got the new options, which have been added to the game, which enables you to run servers where... Basically, you can disable the ability to ride on dino dinos and disable the ability to tame dinos. So again, that keeps things a little bit more even and fair. If you want to run a server like that, where it's impossible to basically have an army of dinosaurs. And then obviously you've got your dino customization um, section where you can basically control which dinosaurs are going to appear in your maps. So you can disable the dinosaurs that you don't like in-game and change their spawn rates and stuff. This is something I've played around with sort of briefly to try and reduce certain things like, I've, like I mean, like certain things like I, I normally disable Trudons because they are an absolute pain in the backside. Um, and Terror Birds, they're, and they're another creature that annoys the hell out of me, so normally I disable them across the board so they never appear on any of my, my maps. And then, obviously, you can change the spawn rates and spawn limits on certain dinosaurs. So, like Therizinosaurus, which spawns a bit highly, a bit too high for the type of dino it is. Again, I can change that to uh, 0.25. That's a big, big nerf on that, actually. But you get the thing. You can go through and you can customise what dinosaurs are spawning and in what sort of quantities on your maps. This section here, again, but like we've saw for the player, you can change the uh, multipliers for the stats. So you can do stats for wild dinosaurs and these stats for tame dinosaurs 
multipliers on tame dinosaurs. Now, if I just reset that back to default, per level stats multipliers tame. These are the default. These are what the default get. And as you can see, health is 0 0.23, damage is 0 0.2. This is because Studio Wildcard did some nerfs to tamed dinosaurs. So basically, I set them back. I override those nerfs and I do the same in the per level stat multiplier section and the affinity section because I don't like nerfs. <laughs> Dino breeding multipliers. Now again, you can change the mating interval between dinosaurs on your server, the egg hatch speed, the baby mature speed, food consumption speed, then you've got your dino imprinting, all that stuff that you know about from in-game, you can change the, you know, the rates then you've got your environment so taming speed you can change that i normally have it set to about five harvest amount i normally set that to about four maybe maybe that's a bit high maybe three resource respawn this is where you set the amount of time before um resources respawn and again then you've got the option to change how far resources respawn around player bases and player structures so again you can change all that then you've got your custom harvest amount multipliers now that's something if you don't want to change harvesting amounts for every item you can come in here and specify certain items only that you want to have increased um, spawn rates on I generally do it for things like maybe narco berries uh, and then things like um, the ch -ch 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 vegetables stuff like that for getting in crafting so you can gain more from those from crops when you get into farming and stuff like that then you've got your day cycle speed daytime speed so again I set the day day cycle speed I halve it and daytime speed again, I probably halve that. And then probably triple the speed of night, because no one likes playing at night because nobody can see anything. Uh, global spoiling time, I probably set that to five. Decomp time is five. Corpse time, I set to probably ten to give you a bit of time to find your bodies if you die. Uh, and again, then you've got things like your crop decay speed, crop growth speed. Egg laying interval, poop intervals, very important. Uh, your hair growth speed, again, I changed that because the hair grows massively fast in this game. And you don't want to have to keep going and finding obsidian to be able to craft scissors to keep cutting your hair. Then you've got your earned XP multipliers. So again, you could change the XP you gain from performing specific functions so again if you're doing a lot of craft you like to do crafting you can increase the experience of crafting if you don't like people getting too much experience from harvesting you can decrease that if you want people to gain more experience by killing things again pretty self-explanatory then we've got the obviously the structure section so structure resistance how much a structure takes damage the lower you make that the more damage it can take before it's destroyed the higher you make that the more the less damage it takes before it's destroyed it's out and that is very backwards that is a very backwards saying you have to say and then you've got your structured damage now this is things like spiked walls traps things like that how much damage they do so again i i increase the damage on those because i like to make those things um actually have a purpose in game um, again max structures visible lower values may help with server speed so I'm gonna set that to 8,000 I'm gonna turn it down a little bit uh, per platform structures multiplier I'm gonna set that to 10 that determines how many items you can place on platforms and rafts and then the number the maximum number of platform and saddle items allowed on the entire server so i've got you know it's set to 50 at the moment again you can change that depending on obviously how many players are joining your server and playing on your server i'm probably going to leave it at 50 because i don't know why anyone would need more than 50 rafts certainly across a server of 
if I've got 40 players, why they would need more than 50 rafts or platforms, I have no idea. Then you've got override structure platform prevention. Now, basically, in the, again, in the official servers, you can't put auto turrets and things like that on platforms and rafts. So you can tick that box to enable that. Allow unaligned dinosaurs. So again, dinosaurs that don't belong to your tribe can't travel on your rafts and platforms. Again, you can tick that box if you want to enable that. Um, allow structures at supply drops in PVE. So again, if enabled, that doesn't make sense because that says allow structures at supply drops PVE. And then the, the tooltip says if enabled will prevent placing structures at supply drop locations. Basically, it stops people building where um, the supply drops and loot crates are going to appear in game. You've got a section here for auto destroying structures. So again, depending on the type of server you're running, if you don't want people coming, you know, if you get people who join your game, build a load of things and then leave your server, you may want to change this so that their structures are destroyed over time which again increases performance on your server. The last thing you want is loads and loads of stuff built up all over your maps with nobody playing because A, it's going to use, obviously, resources on your system and also then for any new players joining your, your server, they're not going to be able to build stuff in those areas. Um, passive defences damage riderless dinos. That's an option that, again, every time you create a profile is not enabled. I enable it because, again, I want things like spiked walls and traps to be able to damage wild dinosaurs and riderless dinos. Again, makes things safer for you. Allows you to put traps and stuff around your your um, your structures and them actually have a use in game. And then you've got sections such as enable Ingram overrides. So, again, you can change engrams you can change at what level engrams are available to players how much they cost you can actually hide engrams from players so that they can't learn them and can't craft items very useful again if you're running mods and you don't want players to have access to certain features and certain items within mods uh, crafting overrides this section here you can use to basically change how many resources are needed to make an item. So again, depending how you want to balance your server, if you think certain items in the game are too easily to come by, you can change the resources to make them a bit of a harder achievement. Then you've got your custom level progressions. And as I mentioned, I increase my custom levels. So my dinosaurs can level up 100 levels. I think they normally, in the default game, are only allowed 70 levels, I think it is. So they get in my, on my servers, they can gain an extra 30 levels and players can gain an extra 15, which enables them to learn a few extra engram points. So again, depending on how you're playing the server, whether you're playing with friends or whether you just want to purely play as a solo player, if you are planning to play as a solo player, you may want to in increase the number of player levels so you can learn, get more engram points to learn more engrams, to give you access to basically everything in the game. You've got your custom game user settings. Now, this is basically where you can enter uh, configuration options for things like mods. There are certain mods, that obviously, I play with. Structures Plus is one of them, where basically you need to enter some... Um, any f normally, you if you were playing it, Obviously, single player, you'd have to go into the game's any files, enter the configurations for those mods. This does it on your server set it, servers files. So again, you'd paste in the, the information you need for each mod. So things like obviously structures plus that I use, the better balance compost bin, things like that, which have configuration options and things to override and change. That's where you do that. Right, moving on to the next section. Server file details. Any changes in this section will require a server restart to take effect. So 
First section, administrators. When you create a server, you will obviously have no administrators set up on your server. Ideally, you probably want to set yourself as an administrator. So to do that, you need to click on the Add Administrator button. Then you need to enter your Steam64 ID, which is obviously a number string. Now, there are a couple of ways to find that. The easiest way is to go to your Steam profile, and it's generally that number there. If you've got the address bar enabled in your settings, so settings, uh, interface, display Steam URL address bar when available. You need to make sure that's enabled, otherwise you will not be able to see the profile IDs. And again, when you click on different players in game, or sorry, different people, you will see different IDs. So let's have a look at Rain. Uh, it should give me her ID, but it doesn't at this point in time, but you can look that up. So that's added me as an administrator. The next section is whitelisted. Now, this causes a lot of confusion for players and for people when they're making their servers, because it doesn't mean what most people assume it means. When most people think of whitelisting, they think of basically an option that you can set so that any people on the list can join the server, and that's not right. <laughs> that's not how ARC works. As I mentioned above, um, I set my maximum number of players on my server to 40. So if I'm running the server and 40 players have connected to the server, and 40 players are in game, if I was to then come along and try to log in, it wouldn't let me because obviously the server has reached its limit of 40 players. So what I can do is add a whitelist player, enter my ID, there we go. You just made the list! And now, if there are 40 players on the server, and I come along and try to join, it will let me join. So I'll basically become player 41 on the server. So basically you can use this option to basically ignore the player cap and allow specific people, certain IDs, to join the server, regardless of how many players are on it. Now, if you want to specify what players can join your server, you need to be using this section here. The enable exclusive join. So if you enable this, only the players in the exclusive join list will be able to log into your server. So again, it makes the server private. But what it means is that by clicking and entering an ID on there. You just made the list. All these people can join the server and they don't need to use any passwords which is very useful if you are running or going to be running multiple servers and allowing transfers between those servers because there is a slight bit of a glitch at the moment with ARC whereby if a server has a password on it, it's very difficult to transfer to and from it. So by enabling this, you don't then need to have a server password. So, again, I'm going to do that for each of my three servers that I set up so I can transfer between them. And again, you just a case of specifying everybody's Steam ID that you want to join. And then the, the, the last, I think, couple of sections on here, you've got your procedurally generated arcs. If you want to basically have your server running a procedurally generated uh, map rather than one of the official maps or any number of the you know user created mod maps this is the section where you do it i've not played around with procedurally generated maps in arc at all because it's a, a feature or a function that's not finished yet it's still in development i think at this point in time it's it's a version two or al and every time they do an update two the um, procedurally generated system 
it wipes out everybody's current procedurally generated maps and stuff. So that's not good if you're running a server. So I don't touch the procedurally generated stuff. Then we've got map spawner overrides. This is a section whereby you can go in and specify different areas of the map where dinosaurs can spawn. So, for example, say you want a Giganotosaurus to be able to spawn on beaches, you can add the Giga to the beach spawner. At the same time, if you don't want certain types of dinosaurs to spawn in certain areas, you can remove those from those areas. Again, very in-depth system. I don't generally touch that because if, again, if I'm going to be removing dinosaurs or controlling their population, I generally do it up here in this section. But again, for certain dinosaurs, things like Quetzals and Gigas and Titanosaurs, they have limited um, spawners. There's only certain positions on a map they can spawn and they have limited um, numbers of spawns. So again, if you want to have more of those on your map, you will need to add those dinosaurs into more of the spawners. So that's something to be aware of. You've got your supply crate override section. This is where you can go in and basically edit and control the items that appear in supply crates, loot drops, beacons, that sort of thing. Now, most people wouldn't bother changing this, but I think it's something that on my servers I'm going to have a look into, have a look at changing, because I do find the current loot system in the vanilla game to be a bit crap, for lack of a better term. I hate going to beacons and finding blueprints for compasses and crop plots and getting wooden walls and wooden ramps from them. Stuff that you're going to have anyway. I would much sooner go to supply crates and find weapons, armour, blueprints for weapons and armour and higher levels of weapons and armour, you know. Apprentice level, journeyman level, mastercraft, ascendant levels, you know, finding saddles and blueprints for saddles. Even finding resources and rare resources, things like silica pearl, cementing paste, obsidian, you know, crystal. Those are the things I'm going to want to be finding in my drops and in my supply crates. So I'm going to possibly go and edit this section and set up my own, if you like, spawns on my servers. And then the last section in the Arc Server Manager is for the survival of the fittest, if you want to enable that game mode. I've never done it, never played it. So, of course, once you've got all your settings how you want them, hit the save button, very important. Please remember to save quite frequently in case it crashes. You don't want to lose your hard work. Okay, and once it's saved, you are then ready to run your server or start your server. So what you do is click the start button. And of course, I've not downloaded the mod because I had to, um, uh, 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 Structures Plus, didn't I? I added Structures Plus. Where is it? Where's the mod section? Oh, I forgot. Message of the day. Good section as well here for you to um, basically specify things that um, get displayed to a player whenever they log into the server. So server rules. Again, things like me, for me, PvP. Uh, base raiding is not permitted <laughs> as an example so yeah i need to download the s plus mod so again if i click that button it's going to go and download the mod and again you don't need to be logged into steam it does it anonymously you don't need to have steam installed on the pc you don't need to have the game installed on the pc i keep stressing that because obviously what i plan to do is have all these servers set up on my laptop actually and basically have my laptop running over in the corner 24 hours a day with the servers running, leaving my PC just for playing the game. Because obviously, if you're running servers on the same PC that you're playing the game on, you need a lot of RAM, a really good processor, because it's quite intensive to run the game. 
because obviously it's an early access game. It's not very well optimized at the moment. And obviously a server is going to be quite intensive, especially if you have lots of people playing on it. So again, for me, that's my plan to get everything set up eventually on my laptop and have my laptop as my dedicated server machine. So there we go. The mod has been downloaded and installed. So now when I click start, I shouldn't have any problems. It will then open up this window. And again, it tells you how much memory is being used. By the system. How much physical memory you've got. I've got 10 gig available. So again, primal game data has only took 16.71 seconds. And there we go. Server is available. So it loaded up very quick because again, I've not got lots of mods. I've not got lots of things set up. I've not changed too many settings. There we go. Server name, so click stop. That will shut down the server. Obviously restart it. Hopefully it should load up quite quickly again. See how fast, because obviously I'm using, obviously enabled the use cache option. So hopefully it should start up a little bit quicker. So yeah, Primal Game Data took a little bit less time to load this time, 14.6. And then obviously it's going to enable Battle Eye. Gaming for Fun, the island server has successfully started. Blah, 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 blah. It tells you obviously what it's using, how many cores, how long it took to do a full startup. And obviously now it's available. How many players are currently in the server? Okay, now. Obviously, great tool. Some people may be interested to know what this tool actually does. So let me go to my servers folder, which again, I said earlier is on my T drive. I created a folder called Art Game Servers. Inside that, I created the three folders, Scorched Earth, the center and the island, because obviously I'm setting my installation location to these folders. So obviously the island is in the island folder. So this is where your server is downloaded to. And you've got, if you go into the shooter game folder, obviously you've got your binaries. You've got your config for all the different things. Content, the mods folder is where you're gonna find your mods when they're downloaded. So like you say, I've got S++ there. There's my S++ mod. That's where that downloads to. Uh, if you go into the saved folder, you've got your saved arcs. So there we go. There's my arc that's been created, the island. Uh, logs. That's where the logs are saved. And then you've got your config, Windows Server. Now what this does, this tool, this tool generates the settings found in the game any. So these are all your settings that we've been entering, stuff like your, your, your baby imprinting, your harvesting rates and stuff like that. Your purse level, level stat multipliers, your experience points needed levels, your dino spawn rate, so where I changed the... Um, uh, do, 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 dino spawn of the Ferrazinosaurus. And then obviously override player engrams. That's in the game any. So that's been generated for you by the arcs by this program. The other way to do it, obviously, if you're running the server without this, would be to type in all this information by hand, which would take you an incredibly long time. And of course, if you happen to make a mistake, like you spelt something wrong, it'd be very difficult for you to troubleshoot that and find it, wouldn't it? 
so don't save any changes because I'm letting and again then your game user settings any so again prevent download survivors difficulty offset override official difficulty all your different settings are all saved in here So there we go, and that's what manages it. So basically, that's how you set up a server with Arc Server Manager. Very, very simple and straightforward. And like I say, there's my island set up. So now if I want to go set up the center, I would just click New Profile, Set Location, Go to Servers, The Center, Select Folder, Change that. There we go. And then it's a case of going through, re-entering all the information again. So again, 7779, 2017, for example. Get my port sorted out straight away. Server name, gaming for fun. The center. Spelled the American way. There we go. And it's just a case of repeating the process for each server you're setting up. I hope that's been an informative video. I hope you've enjoyed watching that. And uh, if you've got any questions or comments about the process, please leave them in the section below. And uh, if you've enjoyed the video, remember, please give it a, a, a like, a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos by me and my gameplay videos, my Let's Plays, hit the subscribe button. For now, thank you for watching. Goodbye.